Hi, my name is Ophi YouTube Videos. I am a feminist and a lesbian, and I make conversational commentary videos about both of those things. This is the abortion video that I've been talking about wanting to make. It's a video that likely is primarily going to be useful to my viewers in the United States, although, you know, if you're from somewhere else and you're just curious about what it's like over here, what I am doing is mostly just gawking from my own comfortable blue state at what abortion access is like in places that didn't get to move to immediately enshrine it after Roe vs. Wade. So if you, like me, are just curious, whether for better or for worse than where you currently are, what abortion access is currently like in roughly a fifth of the states in the United States of America, this is a great video for you to watch. Assuming you enjoy long videos that are deeply conversational as well as hopefully informative, I'm trying some new stuff in this one. Also, a thing worth noting, but not a thing that I am educated enough to have an entire video about, abortion access already was a concern before the Supreme Court's decision in 2022. I just want to acknowledge that the issue is a lot more complicated than the legislative reality of whether or not something is legally allowed. Some of these places I'm telling you about that do allow abortions for a specific period of time or within specific technicalities that might sound more reasonable at first than they actually are don't actually have a wealth of reasonably accessible abortion clinics because more and more shut down every single year. Like with all healthcare, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to make abortion more accessible, and the first step, I think, in having abortion clinics not continue to dwindle is to make sure that their operation is completely legal, legal in a way that does not make abortion providers ever hesitant to do their job. And I'd also like to just say outright, though, you know, people have been finding their way out with every political video I've made, I am absolutely enthusiastically and 100% pro-abortion. That is not only my personal take, but that is the take of the content that I make on my channel. As Trash Discourse said the other day on Twitter, which just really resonated with me, Abortion is literally a miracle. It's the best thing ever invented. Sliced bread wishes it was abortion. I totally agree. Abortion is a miracle. Not in a woo-woo way, but in the way that very much of modern medicine is miraculous. The fact that my eyes don't have to be permanently crossed because people figured out how to do the right thing with the right kind of glass is a miracle. Chemotherapy is a miracle. Vaccines are a miracle. Abortion is a miracle. If there was a stronger word than pro-choice, that is what I would use to defend myself. I'm the kind of pro-choice feminist who thinks I do not want to be pregnant or have a baby is an emergency worthy of abortion. I don't need exceptions for anything because I want it to be completely free to opt in, and I want people to have access to the contraceptives that they need so that abortion can be avoided whenever possible. I believe the solution to that lies with better sex education, accessibility of other avenues of contraceptives, and chilling the fuck out about what goes on beyond that if they do end up needing intervention. I don't even care about some straw woman who is getting four abortions a year. I don't. She can do that if that's what she'd like to do. I would love for somebody to offer her birth control, but okay, you do you. I am compassionate, though, to people who have other ways that they voice and still ultimately agree with the fact that they shouldn't be legislating somebody else's bodily autonomy based on the vibes of what they find sad. Like, I think it's reasonable to just personally find it sad. Be somebody who would think it would be sad for you yourself if you ended up needing to get an abortion. I totally get that. And I also know that Nuance Corner friends here who have experienced pregnancy loss understand that nothing of what they experienced is included in the way that I speak about abortion because it is a completely different thing. But when I'm speaking publicly about how I feel about abortion, I don't feel a need to cede any ground to people who want me to say that I think that abortion is sad. I think enough children already exist and deserve to be worried and sad about, and that muddying anything with emotions only leaves room for people to push further and further on what they try to get me to agree is reasonable so that we don't get too sad when we think about abortion. So. Just so you understand my positioning moving into this video as crystal clear as you possibly can, I love abortion. I think every time you ever have an opportunity to repeal an abortion ban or to enshrine protections for reproductive freedom into law, you should take it. 
you don't need to ever intend on taking advantage of that human right, but I think that you should try to ensure that people have as many human rights as we can give out. There are 10 states this year in the United States of America with the option to vote on reproductive freedom. It should have been more than that, and I do not fully understand what tripped up each of the states that ended up not getting to vote on it this year. There were a few. I know Arkansas came so, so close with their measure, and I am really furious and heartbroken that it got thrown out. And also, this is why send it back to the states is bullshit. They're sending it back to the states until they can pass a federal ban. I think it's naive to operate under any other pretense, no matter how much Vance and Trump are trying to tap dance around whether or not Trump would really veto a ban. If they're not already that far right over there in the Republican Party, just give it a few years, I fear. I'm filming the introductory part of this video on Friday the 11th, which is 25 days before the election, and I'm going to learn as much as I can over the next two days about the current state of abortion in those 11 states and what is getting voted on next month. Not only do I think the whole giving myself a specific amount of time to learn about something thing is going to be a helpful way to make a video that I specifically have three weeks to talk about before voting day comes and goes, and that there are so many other things that I would also like to talk about before voting day comes. But I also just thought it might be, you know, kind of an interesting journey for us to take together. I'm sure this video is, like, I mean, hopefully it's going to be helpful to anyone who actually gets to vote in these elections, but there are probably statistically more of us who aren't actually going to vote on these specific questions this year than otherwise, whether it's because we've already enshrined it in our state legislator, like up here in my liberal coastal bubble, or because the Republicans in power blocked it in your state. And if in any case you're watching it because you're curious, come along with me. Let's be curious together. Also, early voting is happening in a lot of these states already, and if you're at all nervous about voting on election day, or especially if you're somebody who's afraid to vote because you feel like your partner may know, you can vote early and your vote is confidential. There are some really great groups doing great work to help get this message out there. You can find more about it linked in the description below. It's something that seems very simple and obvious, but it's worth saying for anybody who might need to hear it. You get to vote. Obviously, there are other reasons why somebody may not be eligible to vote, but if you are eligible to vote and your partner is trying to attempt to intimidate you into not voting, it is possible for you to still vote in secrecy if that's something that you would like to take the risk to do. Another reason I wanted to kind of take you along on my research with me as I go on this is that I think, since I said earlier, abortion access itself is as much an issue as the legality of it is, I would also like to prove the point that it is significantly harder than it needs to be to even just find the information about a lot of this, and I think that's sort of an intentional thing. When you think about stalling until somebody is just far along enough anyway to not be able to access the care that was so hard to track down in the first place, it, it just makes me mad. I'm checking on actual state web pages for this, as well as various other resources as I go, and I'm thinking as I do, holy shit, this would be so hard to do if I was pregnant and panicking. If you are pregnant and panicking now or in the future, I would recommend going to an abortion access group sooner than just relying on what can be found on the state websites, but I thought those were interesting for my purposes for the sake of just looking. And, and as I noticed in my preliminary research for the first state on our alphabetized list that gets to vote next month, they're confusing to look at. Even when they're trying to attempt to be less confusing, they are deeply confusing. But first up, alphabetically, in this case, is Arizona. Okay, so I ended up staying up pretty late last night doing more research about Arizona's abortion ballot and current abortion access. And now I'm starting to think that a weekend may not have been enough time to give myself for this, but we'll see how we hold up by late Sunday. Like I already said, the Arizona State Attorney General's website just straight up acknowledges how confusing and complicated these access laws are for reproductive care in Arizona. Check out this banner right at the top of the screen. HB 2677, the law that repealed the 1864 near-total abortion ban, took effect on September 14th, 2024. This means that the territorial ban will not become law again in Arizona. The laws summarized below are the laws that are currently in place in Arizona. Arizonans can still obtain and providers cannot be prosecuted for providing abortion care in accordance with Title 36. 
Bookmark this page for continued updates or sign up for email updates. Again, all of this is just so much more complicated than it needs to be, but okay, let's see what the current state of abortion is in Arizona. The first things they tell us are, number one, abortion, including medication abortion, is currently legal in Arizona under certain circumstances and subject to certain restrictions. Two, the law is in flux. Because of ongoing court cases and legislative action, there is a possibility that whether, when, and how abortion is legal in Arizona might change in the future. Three, Arizona has many regulations on abortion care. Under current Arizona law, the term abortion refers to, quote, the use of any means to terminate the clinically diagnosable pregnancy of a woman with knowledge that the termination by those means will cause, with reasonable likelihood, the death of the unborn child. Their definition of abortion in Arizona does not include birth control devices such as IUDs or contraceptives that inhibit or prevent ovulation such as the birth control pill or oral contraceptives that inhibit or prevent conception of the implantation of a fertilized ovum in the uterus, meaning morning after pills or plan B, or any means to terminate an ectopic pregnancy or remove a deceased fetus. For example, if you have a miscarriage and the doctor performs a surgical procedure to remove the deceased fetus, that is not an abortion. Because these procedures and medications do not fall within the definition of abortion under Arizona law, regulations and restrictions on abortion do not apply to any of them. So, uh, in terms of these restrictions, doctors can perform procedural abortions up to 15 weeks into the pregnancy. So, they're defining it here as 15 weeks gestational age. Gestational age meaning the age of the fetus, as calculated from the first day of the patient's last menstrual period. I might be reading too much into this, but I'm interested to see if other states also use this gestational age language, because to me it feels very much like it centers the personhood of the fetus rather than the person who is pregnant, right? But also maybe this is standard, we're learning about this together, and I've only started looking into Arizona for right now. Someone could get an abortion, as already established, at any point including after 15 weeks, if a doctor determines that there is a medical emergency. Medical emergency is defined by the state law in this context to mean a situation where immediate abortion care is necessary to avoid the patient's death or when delaying abortion care will create a serious risk of substantial and irreversible impairment of a major bodily function. I... okay. We're going to do an entire section just about medical exceptions for abortions and some issues that are run into with that, so... Bear with me, I want to get through the rest of this page first. It also says Arizona law makes it illegal for doctors to perform abortions for certain impermissible reasons, for example, if the abortion is sought because of the sex or race of the fetus. And it clarifies again that medication abortion is legal, and that abortion can be performed in Arizona either with medication, and it specifically names the one that is okay, because other types have already been banned there or that it's fine by procedure. And then it says that Arizona, like many states, does not have exceptions for rape or incest, and I'm quoting directly here. That means if you become pregnant by a rapist or blood relative and would like to get an abortion, you must do so before the gestational age of the fetus exceeds 15 weeks. An abortion after 15 weeks is legal only if a doctor determines that there is a medical emergency as explained above. And this really makes me grind my teeth. So, okay, I just decided when I was saying that we're going to talk about exceptions, I'm going to interrupt our state-by-state -state rundown, and in between each of them, we're going to talk about things that are positioned to soften anti-choice rhetoric and why they are bullshit. And the first one that we're going to do will be about this whole exceptions bullshit, because that is a line that Trump has been peddling that he believes in exceptions, just like worsty Ronald Reagan does, and fuck that! But I do want to finish this page, which continues talking about why it's so difficult to understand the current law in Arizona, like in that helpfully, I guess, numbered banner earlier. Understand that the law is in flux and might change. Several of Arizona's abortion laws, as well as some federal laws, are being litigated in the courts right now, so the law may change in the coming months and years. You can read more about some of these cases, but here are some of the issues that are not yet permanently settled. In two different federal cases, the legality of mufepristone and how it can be used are being litigated. Arizona law already has restrictions on abortion medication, but those federal cases might ultimately make minipristone 
unavailable or limit how it can be used, which could affect access in Arizona. Arizona law makes it a crime for a doctor to knowingly perform an abortion that is sought solely because of a genetic abnormality to the fetus. The meaning and application of that law is not clear, and it is still being litigated in court. Maybe because this kind of thing is extremely fucking stupid to legislate and people should just be able to get abortions when they want them? Just throwing that out there. And then it says, bookmark this page for continued updates or sign up for email updates. And again, email updates for something that should just be understood as a human right. Horrifying. And then there's more about the legality of abortion in Arizona before the email sign up for more updates. Understand how Arizona regulates abortion. Even legal abortions in Arizona are highly regulated. And again, like the gestational age thing, maybe I am sensitive, but I do not like these quotes around legal because why does it even need to be in quotes? Legal already means what it means without quotes around it. Quotes in this context feel like implying that it's allegedly legal, but I could be wrong. I'm just some lady. I'm clearly sensitive about this. Let's continue. For the most part, these laws impose obligations on medical providers, not patients, but having some awareness of what to expect when you seek care may give you some peace of mind or help you think about what questions you want to ask providers as you consider the options available to you. Here are some examples of how Arizona law regulates abortion as of today. In this list, the only thing that I found even remotely ensuring was the part that it clarified that although the hospital or facility that performed the abortion is required to report certain information, the hospital or facility is legally prohibited from identifying the patient's name or any other information that would make it possible to identify the patient who sought or obtained an abortion. Otherwise, I don't like it. This state, with no exceptions for incest or rape, requires parental consent for an abortion written and notarized, or if you can't get that, authorization from a judge. Can you imagine being a pregnant teenager and having to wait for a court date to hear whether or not you can schedule the abortion you need? Holy fuck. Inhumane. It also says medication abortion may be provided only by a qualified physician, and it cannot be provided through a courier, delivery, or mail service. Again, hate this. I love that many states have services where people can safely order medication abortions online, as long as the information is easily accessible about what dosing may not work for bodies of specific sizes, and people are actually getting the reproductive health care they need, I think it should be that easy and simple. I think outlawing it is really, really terrible. Ideally, it should be free. I know that's extra radical, but we are being radical about abortion here in the nuance corner. It also says only licensed physicians can perform surgical abortions, and the physician and their office has to put the patient through a lot in order to get to that point. Like in many states, there's an Arizona requirement that at least 24 hours before the patient receives the abortion, they must get an ultrasound and, quote, be offered the opportunity to view the active ultrasound image and hear an explanation of what the ultrasound shows which feels like really paternalistic bullshit. I'm going to wait to make my BoJack Horseman reference for an interlude here, but I am thinking about that one episode, too, a lot. And outside of that, like, okay, now that I saw this ultrasound, I don't need healthcare anymore, thanks? And at least 24 hours before the abortion, it says the patient must get these other notices, too, and be told them by a medical provider and in person. The probable anatomical and physiological characteristics of the fetus when the abortion is scheduled to be performed, the nature of the proposed procedure or treatment, the immediate and long-term medical risks associated with the procedure that a reasonable patient would consider material to the decision of whether or not to undergo the abortion, the medical risks of continuing with the pregnancy, and that the biological father of the fetus is, quote, liable to assist in the support of the child, even if he has offered to pay for the abortion, end quote. And then we see on the bottom, they have a disclaimer that none of this is legal advice or whatever, which obviously it also is not in this video, but you already know that because you're watching YouTube and not even one of the channels by some fancy lawyer. So, okay. It looks like abortion has been really contentious in Arizona, and since I told you I'm bringing you along with me on my research, here's a little look behind the curtain. I have got to know more about that ban that got repealed. Why was it from 1864? How did something from 1864 come back after Rofell? What the fuck? 
I moved on from it earlier because I had stuff to read, but that is wild, and this does seem to be a success that Arizona Democrats were able to turn out. Although forward momentum with abortion rights is always so much slower than the backwards pushes are. So I'm going to figure out what they were up against and get back to you, and then we're going to talk about what's getting voted on in November. Also, is this an engaging format for a deep dive, or do you prefer it if I just gather everything ahead of time? Because admittedly, other than that I know that we're going over each of these states and questions, I am building my outline as I go here. Y'all know that I love making long form, and enough of you have said that you like having me on in the background that I no longer feel guilty about being indulgent on length. So, all right. So maybe let me know what you think of that, um, but I'm going to see what I can figure out. I'm back. Hi. I watched a couple videos and I read through an article or two. You can find the videos I watched linked in the description below, particularly this one from CBC. It was before the law was repealed, but it really helped me to understand how the law happened in the first place. This law criminalizing abortion actually even predates the existence of Arizona as a state. It was a Civil War era law and it was never technically repealed following the original Roe Supreme Court decision. As in 1973, not 2022. Right, Jojo? Yeah? That federal decision that abortion was a constitutional right made this old Arizona law unenforceable. But it was never actually repealed. It just became dormant. Over the course of the next few decades, Arizona lawmakers passed, or attempted to pass, various rules on when, how, and why abortions would be allowed, including most recently in 2022. Arizona's governor signed a controversial bill into law this week. There is now a ban on abortions in the state after 15 weeks. Then just three months after that law came into effect, the entire landscape changed. So the argument was made then whether or not this most recent abortion law that had been signed by the governor was supposed to replace this law that hadn't ever been repealed. Except part of it explicitly said that it wasn't, which is what the Supreme Court ran with. But the governor who signed it into law claims that he was under the impression that this law would be what would be upheld if Roe fell and not the Civil War era law. He got voted out, thank fucking God. I mean, at least now he's talking like he opposes this full criminalization, and I guess he thought he was, like, cooperating with both conservatives and progressives by saying, yes, abortion, but only until 15 weeks. Which is, by the way, still a solid 10 weeks before viability, which is not enough time. You can't just make someone finish out the last 10 weeks of a pregnancy. What if somebody is unable to take their psych meds and they had never spent a prolonged amount of time not on it, and the combination of being pregnant and also being unable to take their psych meds puts them at a very real risk of harming themselves, and they didn't know that until more than 15, but less than the amount of time when they could, even if, you know, and, and I don't even think that somebody should be forced to give birth or to have a C-section. Like, a C-section is intense abdominal surgery. And I don't even think that somebody should be forced to, like, just because, I mean, I, I, I think when viability, I know this is where I get sticky because I'm a bit more radical than a lot of people, but I don't feel comfortable with the idea of forcing anybody into intense abdominal surgery when they could just have an abortion. That's the kind of feminist I am. But do you think a judge would rule that somebody not being able to access their medication because they're pregnant is an emergency? Because I really, really don't. Not in a lot of these cases. I think they're extremely willing to have pregnant people kill themselves when the alternative is just offering them safe abortion. And I'm not willing to accept that as a possibility. I think somebody, even if it's not even that extreme, but like I am going to sometimes throw out extreme examples because abortion can be extremely extreme. It shouldn't be, but there are some cases where it is. So rather than going with like existing knowledge of how the law works, where newer laws supersede older laws, the Supreme Court in Arizona did rule that the new ban was just irrelevant and that the old one was to be upheld. It didn't actually end up going into effect, but there was a very real fear and a very real possibility that it might have. And the new governor, Katie Hobbs, who I know very little about other than that she seems to have really done her goddamn job with this one thing, so hell yes, Katie Hobbs, thank you. 
Thank you, Arizonans, for voting Democrat, because again, especially what we're about to learn about the attorney general in Arizona in this next clip, they were really doing what they could to make sure that even if this technically was the law in Arizona, that nobody would truly go to jail for it, which was what was being threatened for the abortion provider and the patient. Near total Civil War era ban that continues to hang over our heads only serves to create more chaos for women and doctors in our state. Last year, Governor Katie Hobbs, a Democrat, signed an executive order giving all the power to enforce abortion laws to the state attorney general, essentially stripping the state's elected county attorneys of their authority to prosecute abortion cases. She says that isn't changing. I refuse to allow extremist county prosecutors to use this abortion ban to lock up women and doctors seeking or providing needed health care. And in turn, the attorney general, who's also a Democrat, says she won't enforce the law, even though it mandates prison time for anyone helping provide an abortion. No woman or doctor will be prosecuted under this draconian law. She said her office is looking for options to make sure the law doesn't even get implemented. The video then went into speaking about how the bill might be repealed, and the host offered multiple options for how and talked about voting, which we're obviously going to get to soon. But her first option, as she was laying out ways that it might end up not taking effect, was actually pretty much exactly how it went. One, state legislators could repeal the ban. Now, Arizona has a Republican-led legislature, which so far has been in favor of abortion restrictions. But in the last couple of days, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have come out against the ruling. Let me be very clear. This decision cannot stand. This is a devastating day, but we are far from being defeated. This is outrageous that we would even dignify the consideration of this type of ban. There's a good chance, frankly, that the legislature will simply repeal the territorial ban. That's all it takes is a one-liner, and that would that would then um, reinstate the 15-week law in full. And yeah, that's pretty much what happened. The 16-week ban is what is currently in effect, and the ballot question is seeking to greatly expand the availability of abortion access in the state. So. Aside from, I know, normie lib moment, but like this is why we say vote blue down ballot. This is a circumstance where that ended up very much mattering. 15 weeks is not great, but it's better than completely banned and also criminalized and you would go to jail. So let's play what's on that ballot. Uh, Arizona Proposition 139, the Right to Abortion Initiative. And I'm going to read for this section directly from the Ballotpedia page, linked in my description like everything else. I love Ballotpedia. I've been using it to be very nosy. And I also use it when I'm double checking things about my ballot measures in Massachusetts, even though I got my little paper booklet a little while back. So a yes vote on the right to abortion initiative supports amending the state constitution to provide for the fundamental right to abortion that the state of Arizona may not interfere with before the point of fetal viability, defined as the point of pregnancy where there is significant chance of the survival of the fetus outside of the uterus without the application of extraordinary medical measures, unless justified by a compelling state interest, defined as a law or regulation enacted for the limited purpose of improving or maintaining the health of the individual seeking abortion care that does not infringe on that individual's autonomous decision making. <laughs> A no vote opposes amending the state constitution to provide for the fundamental right to an abortion. No! Yes, on 139 Arizona. If you are from Arizona and you're looking for a good resource, I'm linking below to ArizonaForAbortionAccess.org. Also, this goes for my viewers from anywhere who have organized for abortion access, but I would genuinely love to hear about it in the comments if you're interested in sharing what the experience was like getting abortion on the ballot in Arizona or anywhere. If you have clips you would like to share or maybe record for me about what that was like, I would be stoked to make a video about people sharing their experience about what organizing for legislative access to abortion was like. 
And I also have a video planned at some point about crisis pregnancy centers. I have a really long-standing righteous fury about crisis pregnancy centers, meaning the ones that are actually fronts for anti-choice groups, but who present themselves as otherwise in order to lure in people hoping for abortion access. And then they lie to them about their options, and they're evil. They're evil. If anyone has any kind of information they'd like to share with me about that, I would also love to hear about it. If you don't want to share it in my comment section, feel free to reach out on my socials, maybe? I'm not trying to crunch that video in before the election, though. I would like to take my time with it. But the fact that there is a new abortion access bill on the books in Arizona is due to the organization of so many people. Like I said, I watched a couple of videos about what's going on in Arizona, and this was one where it was showing exactly how many signatures were being gathered. In these boxes dropped off signatures of those who want an amendment to Arizona's constitution. The proposal is to allow abortions until a fetus is viable, which is typically around 24 weeks. And as long as even half of the signatures gathered get verified, you'll vote on it. Previously, Republican lawmakers had thought about proposing a counter ballot measure, but never filed anything. I feel extremely hopeful for Arizona. Um, I'm not going to say if I feel unhopeful for any states because that's not helpful. And I, I really don't. I feel like from what I've seen so far, abortion does very well when it is on the ballot. And this measure is really good. I like the ones that are saying up until fetal viability because sure. Because, okay. But also if somebody put a bill in front of me that said ninth month abortions too, I would still sign it. Let's move into our first intermission here. Exceptions are bullshit. People smarter and more educated than me have written about this, and I would rather cite from them instead of just repeating and expanding on what I already said as it came up in my response to the Arizona law. When people, and especially now recently Donald Trump, talk about exceptions to abortion ban, what is cited are usually for the so-called big three. You'll hear Trump claiming that just like Reagan, he believes in exceptions in the case of rape, incest, and the health of the mother. But uh, in practice, that those don't really happen. They don't actually get granted. Here from a New York Times article by Amy Schoenfeld Walker called Most Abortion Bans Include Exceptions, in practice, few are granted. The abortion bans enacted in about half the states since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June do not prohibit abortion entirely. Most make exceptions in certain circumstances, commonly to protect the health or life of the mother or in the case of rape or incest. And as conservative state lawmakers prepare to take up new restrictions on abortion in upcoming legislative sections, exceptions will be at the heart of the debate. But in the months since the court's decision, very few exceptions to these new abortion bans have been granted. A New York Times review of available state data and interviews with dozens of physicians, advocates, and lawmakers revealed. Instead, those with means are traveling to states where abortion is still broadly legal or are obtaining abortion pills at home because the requirements to qualify for exceptions are too steep. Doctors and hospitals are turning away patients, saying that ambiguous laws and the threat of criminal penalties make them unwilling to test the rules. Having the legal right to, on the books to get an abortion and getting one in practice are two distinctly different things, said Lori Bertram Roberts, the executive director of the Mississippi Reproductive Freedom Fund, a group that supports abortion rights. An example of that disconnect is in Louisiana, which has exceptions for protecting the life or health of the patient and for deadly birth defects, and has reported zero abortions since its ban take place. And has reported zero abortions since its ban took place. Mississippi, with exceptions for rape and protecting the life of the patient, has reported no more than two. Alabama, Kentucky, Missouri, and Texas have exceptions for protecting a patient's life or health and have reported similarly low abortion figures. There is no reliable estimate for the number of patients who seek abortions because of sexual assault or pregnancy complications, yet experts say the number is undoubtedly much more than zero. Thousands of women have most likely qualified for exceptions to state abortion bans in the months since Roe was overturned, they say. A majority of Americans think abortion should be legal in most circumstances, and even those who otherwise oppose abortion generally support exceptions for rape and for health complications. But abortion rights advocates say that legal exceptions do nothing but make abortion bans appear more reasonable than they really are. 
Abortion opponents, including those who designed the laws, say the laws are working as intended. Exceptions should be rare. If doctors are not treating patients who qualify, they say, those doctors are to blame for overinterpreting the law. And as far as the rape and incest exceptions, I already talked about having to go to a judge to get your parental consent requirement overridden, but you would also have to go to the law about the assault itself, too, in many of these cases. From the article again, About a quarter of states that prohibit abortions require allowances for rape and incest victims, and nearly all of those require a proof of assault from a police report or a doctor's note. Anti-abortion advocates say that a police report is necessary to prove that an assault happened and to prevent providers from using the exception as a backdoor to access. Those who work with sexual assault victims say a requirement to report to law enforcement is one of the steepest barriers for those who seek abortion. About two-thirds of victims do not report to law enforcement. Many know their abuser and worry about the consequences. The time crunch that you would be on to need to do this and process this, not just internally to yourself, not just to know enough to know that you do not want to have a baby, but also while having laws that outlaw abortion after a specific time frame and sometimes do not even include these exceptions within that time frame. It's just really, really shitty. I really hate it. All of this in this article, which you should read, and it is linked in the description below, is from 2023. So here is something more recent from NPR just this month, just to really reinforce how rarely exceptions actually do get used. A few years ago, the case of a 10-year-old rape victim who got an abortion in Indiana made national news. But cases like that are rare. There is no database tracking abortions permitted for rape. For this story, NPR looked at state records and talked to doctors and advocates in places that theoretically grant these exemptions. I've never seen someone get an exemption. Lori Bertram Roberts is with the Mississippi Reproductive Freedom Fund. It's an organization that helps people statewide access abortion. Mississippi's law does technically allow the procedure if someone's been raped. But the question is, even if you got an exemption in Mississippi, who's going to perform your abortion? NPR reached out to Reeves' office, as well as lawmakers in multiple states who sponsored these bans, and to national anti-abortion groups. None of them wanted to speak on this subject. One group, Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America, did issue a written statement. It reads, quote, If there are doctors who are confused about rape exceptions, hospital administrations and health associations should provide clarity. Jessica Tarleton is an obstetrician in South Carolina. She says many doctors there are scared. Like, well, I don't have time to get into this. I don't have a lawyer. I don't want to pay somebody to do this. And so I'm just going to stay away. You know, I'm just going to distance myself from that practice altogether. In South Carolina, the law mandates that doctors like Tarleton can perform an abortion for pregnancy due to rape. Afterward, they must report it to their local sheriff's office. I think we're turning patients into potential criminals. Involving law enforcement, she says, makes patients and doctors feel like they're in trouble. Tarleton says no other kind of medicine demands doctors legally justify care. Somebody comes into the emergency room who's been shot. We don't ask them what they did to be in a position to be shot. You know, we take care of the patient. She still tries to offer abortion care to assault victims whenever she legally can. It's rare. The number of exceptions granted for rape is hard to measure. When providers report abortion data, they don't include the reason an abortion was performed. NPR talked to doctors and advocates in six of the 11 states that theoretically grant exemptions for rape. Only a handful of doctors reported using the law with any consistency. Those who did were all specialists at academic medical institutions, like Dr. Nisha Verma in Georgia. Probably see someone who has been um, raped or experienced incest who meets that exception maybe every couple weeks. At my institution, we have really, again, worked to create a system that helps us as doctors feel more supported and protected, providing the maximum amount of care that we can under this very restrictive law. She still has to turn patients away, but she says she can at least have candid conversations with them about whether the law allows them to have an abortion when they've been raped. For NPR News, I'm Katie Riddle. And before we move to cover our next state, Elizabeth Nash for Ms. Magazine makes what I think is a really compelling argument just in the headline itself of her article published in 2023. 
Focusing on exceptions misses the true harm of abortion bans. If you're following the debate around the total bans on abortion in place in states across the country, you might think what makes them extreme and harmful is whether they have certain exceptions, like those for people experiencing life-threatening pregnancy complications. Harrowing stories about people in these circumstances in Texas, Louisiana, and more continue to generate huge media attention because they so clearly expose the depravity of anti-abortion policies. But this overwhelming focus on whether bans have exceptions and whether people can get abortions in extreme situation distorts our perception of what is actually happening in states that ban abortion, which is that abortion bans are extreme and harmful because they ban abortion, period. Losing sight of that simple truth means ignoring and even inadvertently stigmatizing most people who want and need abortions. Elizabeth writes that correcting public narratives around abortion bans is critical, and that in order to do that, we should reframe our conversations around exceptions in the following three ways. Number one, exceptions are designed to be unworkable. Anti-abortion policymakers see exceptions as loopholes and designed them to be difficult, if not outright impossible, to use even for the few who qualify under their narrow limits. Rather, exceptions function mainly as PR tools to make abortion bans seem less cruel than they are and distract from the inhumanity of the ban itself. You should read this whole article. It's linked below. I'm reading you a lot of the article, and I know I said you should read the other one too. But if you're reading just one of the articles I pulled from for this intermission, I would say that this one is probably less heartbreaking and more helpful than the other one is, and the other one is very deeply informative and also very deeply heartbreaking. The second point Elizabeth asks us to remember for this reframe is two, focusing on exceptions ignores the vast majority of people harmed by abortion bans. Data shows about 75% of abortion patients are low income in their 20s and are already parents. Black and brown people make up a disproportionate share of abortion patients due to higher rates of unintended pregnancy that reflect pervasive health disparities rooted in a long history of racism. These groups have the fewest resources to overcome the enormous logistical and financial barriers that abortion bans create. And just before Roe was overturned, Gutmacher research showed that the need for abortion care was rising, with 930,000 abortions being obtained in the United States in 2020, an 8% jump from 2017. The harm abortion bans are causing every single day is enormous, and the focus on exceptions distracts from the pain and damage abortion bans inflict on predominantly marginalized communities. And for the third point, she wrote, The focus on exceptions creates a false hierarchy of who is deserving of care. Stories that center people whom exceptions support, if only on paper, resonate because they expose the abject cruelty of anti-abortion policymakers. But this focus also fuels the perception that people in some circumstances are more deserving of an abortion than others. Inadvertently ranking the validity of people's reasons for seeking abortion care challenges their agency and right to bodily autonomy. In the long term, this feeds into the anti-abortion movement's false and dangerous narrative that seeks to delegitimize the reasons people have abortions, with the ultimate goal of outlawing abortion for anyone, anywhere, and for any reason. Even though exceptions don't work in practice, people in those circumstances and anyone who needs an abortion should have the right to compassionate and accessible abortion care. But when we let exceptions dominate the narrative about abortion bans, we fail to recognize the true scale and depth of harm that abortion bans intentionally inflict. In this post-Roe reality, recognizing that exceptions are not workable is just the first step. Understanding everyone's equal right to reproductive health and autonomy is the foundation we need to build on. And yeah, 100%, I think that is really helpful framing, and it's a really great explanation of why I both am not heartened by an abortion ban having exceptions, and why, I said earlier, I'm not trying to constantly bring up the most extreme circumstances when I'm saying that abortion is necessary, because... As Elizabeth ended her article, in the end, deciding they need an abortion is the only reason anyone should ever need to get one. And with that intermission out of the way, let's talk about abortion access in Colorado. I think the length of these sections per state is going to be incredibly uneven, but that's okay because I have genuinely no idea how long this video is going to be. I think we're like roughly an hour in right now, but I don't actually know, and I have no idea how many hours into the hours we're in. <laughs> but the Colorado Attorney General has a really helpful PDF that we will now read together, and Colorado currently seems to have really good legal access to abortion, though I didn't look into how many clinics there are out there. Right off the bat, I like that it says know your reproductive rights. 
Uh, that's like the banner on top. It's my, my, the back of my shirt. I've showed it for just a second earlier when I was putting this sign up. Um, my shirt is, it was a fundraiser shirt that Fundy Fridays did right before Roe versus Wade overturned. But when we knew that that was going to happen, it's the only piece of YouTuber merch I currently own. That might not stay the case for forever. But this one references the trigger laws that were in place in many of these states that means that we now have so many bans across the United States following that Supreme Court decision. And it said how many states would lose their rights and said, know your rights on the bottom. So I just, I saw it and I was like, oh, it's like my shirt. This is in a question and answer format. Question number one, do I have a right to an abortion in Colorado, even though the United States Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade? Yes, in Colorado, every individual who becomes pregnant has a fundamental right to choose to continue in a pregnancy or to have an abortion. Question number two, do I have to be a resident of Colorado to receive an abortion in Colorado? No. Under Colorado law, reproductive health care, including abortion, is available in Colorado to anybody who seeks it. Note that some states may try to restrict their residents' ability to access abortion in other states. Many states that moved to enshrine abortion following the fall of Roe v. Wade made it so that it is also legal for other people to seek care for abortion in their state and not be essentially extradited by their original state. That's clearly not currently the case in Colorado, but that is why they mention it. Next question, will my insurance cover my abortion? Private insurers are not required to cover the cost of an abortion, but many do. Okay, and then it says, if you have Medicaid or Health First, the cost of an abortion is only covered when necessary to save a woman's life or in cases of rape or incest. And if you have insurance through a government employer, the cost of an abortion is only covered when necessary to save a woman's life. That's interesting. If insurance will not cover the cost of your abortion, financial assistance may be available, and then they have resources linked. Nice move, Colorado Attorney General. Can I get an abortion if I am under the age of 18? Yes. While Colorado law does not require that minors receive the consent of their parents or guardians before obtaining an abortion, parents or guardians generally must be given notice in advance. Under some circumstances, a judge may waive this notification requirement. Next question, can I get a prescription for medication abortion in Colorado? Yes. In Colorado, physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants can prescribe abortion medication in the first 10 weeks of pregnancy via a telehealth appointment. Telehealth providers in Colorado typically require that a patient be physically located in Colorado during their telehealth consultation and that a patient provide a Colorado mailing address for the delivery of the abortion medication. Does Colorado law restrict abortion? No, Colorado law protects the right to reproductive health care, including abortion. It does not require notification of or consent by a spouse or partner as a precondition for receiving an abortion, nor does it impose any mandatory waiting requirement before receiving an abortion. Can a local government limit rights to abortions in Colorado? No, only the state legislature can pass regulations pertaining to abortion access. The state's Reproductive Health Equity Act protects reproductive health care, including access to abortion, from local government restrictions. Does Colorado law protect my right to use contraceptives, the morning after pill, and other reproductive health care, even though the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade? Yes. Under Colorado law, each individual has a fundamental right to make decisions about their own reproductive health care, which includes the right to choose or refuse contraception. Colorado law also generally requires that health insurance policies sold within the state by insurance companies include coverage for contraception. Colorado law does not restrict use of the morning after pill. And the final question is, if I decide to have an abortion, will I be harassed by protesters? The answer is, you should not be. Under Colorado law, it is a crime for a person to approach within 8 feet of you without your consent if you are within 100 feet of an abortion clinic. It is also a crime for someone to knowingly impede your entry or exit from an abortion clinic. Which is good because I hadn't quite figured out what intermission number two was going to be, and now I have an idea for a story I can tell you. It'll be a short one, um, much like this Colorado section is coming out to be, but... Oh, this one time I covered a shift at a different store than I normally worked at when I was a barista and it was right next to a Planned Parenthood. Hmm. We'll get there. And then that same legal thing that the other one had saying that it's not legal counsel, whatever. 
They must like have to do that for a state attorney general website. So that's the current state of abortion in Colorado. There's not currently any kind of restriction, but there is an amendment coming up on your ballot. So let's play what's on that ballot again. Colorado Amendment 79, the Right to Abortion and Health Insurance Coverage Initiative, is on the ballot in Colorado as an initiated constitutional amendment on November 5, 2024. This initiative would provide a right to abortion in the state constitution. The initiative would prohibit the state or local governments from denying or impeding the right to abortion and allow abortion to be a covered service under health insurance plans. The initiative would repeal Section 50 of Article V of the Colorado Constitution, adopted in 1984, which prohibited the use of public funds for abortion. There is a supermajority requirement. A 55% supermajority requirement is required for approval of the initiative. And if you are voting in Colorado, it is Amendment 79. A yes vote supports creating a right to abortion in the state constitution and allowing the use of public funds for abortion. Hooray! We love it. Or a no vote opposes creating a right to abortion in the state constitution and opposes repealing a constitutional provision that bans the use of public funds for abortion. Okay, and then uh, intermission before I look into the next state here. Now, I've talked about this before, just only a little bit. Like, it just comes up when it comes up, but I haven't really gone into depth in it. I was a barista for a really long time. I feel like that's probably not surprising. Like, that's why my face... I mean, also, like, just being neurodivergent and growing up having to mask. But, like, you used to get written up at Starbucks if you didn't have a vaguely pleasant expression. (laughs) But anyway, when I was not working at Starbucks, but I was working for another coffee chain, I one time picked up a shift at a store I had never been to before. And I worked shifts in coffee shops in parts of the city that I normally don't go to all the time. Like, it was not a big deal. But this one, I didn't realize until I was getting out of the lift in front of it, was right next to a Planned Parenthood. And I was picking up some busy weekend shift at an understaffed coffee shop, and I was like, oh god looking around at what part of the city that this was in, I was like, I should not have accepted this. It's going to be busy. This sucks. They let me out in front of the Planned Parenthood rather than in front of the coffee shop. And it's like maybe two doors down, if that, if not right next door. Like, I think there's maybe something in between. And there's this whole group of old people. They were all old. There weren't any young people there. There was this whole group of old people holding signs with like, really high quality visualizations of what a fetus would look like and their signs. And I got out of the back of this lift and this lady like looked at me and she stepped towards me and she smiled at me. And it was the fucking smile that set me off, man. (laughs) I am not a confrontational person, really. Uh, I mean, I know I, I, I sit here in my bedroom and I talk a lot, but I don't, in person, normally I'm not very confrontational at all, but this, I I had, I had it in me that day, because I closed the lift behind me, and I looked at this woman, and I said, I think you're a piece of shit, and she, like, was surprised, (laughs) and I should have just left it there, probably, but I didn't, and I hope she still thinks about this as often as I do. I said, I'm not pregnant, but you looked at me and you wanted me to be pregnant because you wanted me to be here alone getting an abortion so that you could try to talk me out of it. You are a piece of shit. You don't give a shit about anything other than imaginary babies. And then I left and I went to work and then about, I don't know, (laughs) 10 minutes later, I'm like just getting settled in. It's fine. That whole group comes in, carrying their fucking signs. They come in, and they're coming to the counter, and I didn't even have time to really explain myself. I just looked at the other barista, and I was like, I need to, I need to be in the back right now. And they were like, are you okay? And I was like, I can't make this woman a drink. <laughs> so I went, and I hid in the back, and I did dishes, because unfortunately, coffee shops like that really probably would not take kindly on the minimum wage workers being like, hey, no, I fucking hate everything about your morals. I'm not making you a drink. But I 
I couldn't make them a drink. I could not make them a drink. I couldn't do it. And I really didn't want to deal with having to interact with somebody I had just yelled at while I was now at work because I wasn't at work and she wasn't at work prior to that. Like she would have tried to make me apologize. I feel like, (laughs) and I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Uh, That's my story. It's like I said, very brief intermission, but very rarely have I raised my voice at another human being, like, directly to their face in an angry way. Like, sometimes I talk loud because I'm, like, just talking loud, but, like, (laughs) when I'm mad, I'm normally not a yeller. I, like, can't express to you how few times I have actively shouted at somebody, and that was one of them. I think, I think it's okay. I think it's morally okay to yell at protesters outside of abortion clinics. I really do. Okay. Um, I took a break, but let's talk about Florida. I did go hunting, but I didn't find an official state webpage for Florida like I did for the first two. And I was trying, but it wasn't coming up in my initial Googling. So so even though I thought that the state attorney general website was going to have that for everyone, it didn't, I guess. Uh, so I'm sourcing instead from the Florida ACLU website. It says Florida is currently under a near-total abortion ban, which went into effect this May, and that a 15-week abortion ban had been approved more than two years ago. Florida's current ban has no real exceptions for rape, incest, or the health of the patient. It bans abortion before many people even realize they are pregnant, and before many pregnancies can be detected on an ultrasound. It means doctors risk prison time just for treating the patient in front of them. This guide provides answers to frequently asked questions about abortion access in Florida. I'm not going to read every single question on this FAQ, but I am going to read a lot of them. I think it's helpful to get about the same information as we got about in Arizona, right? Um, So the first one I want to read is, I've heard it called a six-week abortion ban. Does that mean I can access an abortion up to six weeks after learning I'm pregnant? No. This ban outlaws abortion before many people even realize they are pregnant, and often before a pregnancy can be detected on an ultrasound. That's crazy! I'm sorry, but, like, before there's even anything that can be detected on an ultrasound? Even a lot of people who oppose unrestricted abortions think that this is too much, because this is too much. The next question clarifies that even more. Can I access an abortion up to six weeks after I was impregnated? Conception. No. This ban starts the clock on the first day of your last menstrual period, not from conception. Under Florida law, you are considered six weeks pregnant about two weeks after you have missed your period if your periods are regular. Since a limited number of doctors will provide abortions in Florida, it may be difficult for most people to obtain the two state-mandated in-person doctor appointments, which must be at least 24 hours apart in order to have an abortion. What if I don't know I'm pregnant within that time frame? It will be illegal for most people to access an abortion in Florida if they don't know they are pregnant within this time frame. The vast majority of people will be required to carry pregnancies to term or to travel out of the state to obtain an abortion. If you or someone you know needs an abortion, more information is available at INeedAn.com. Florida's abortion ban applies to medication abortions as well as the abortion procedure, and it is a crime for abortion medication pills to be sent through the mail. Florida's extreme abortion ban requires that abortion medication be dispensed in person by a physician and not through the mail. It is unclear at this point how law enforcement and prosecutors will enforce this provision and how Florida courts will interpret it. Florida's abortion ban makes it difficult for survivors of rape, incest, and human trafficking to access an abortion in Florida. Under the ban, survivors of rape, incest, and human trafficking are required to provide documentation of their assault, and if they don't, they will be required to carry and give birth. There are no exceptions for rape, incest, or human trafficking after the 15th week of pregnancy. Florida also seems to have the same issue where it claims that there are laws to protect the health of a pregnant patient and then they're actually inaccessible. Already there have been several instances of pregnant women in emergency situations being required to wait for medical care or to carry non-viable pregnancies to term. Florida's ban makes it a felony crime for doctors to perform an abortion, with criminal penalties of up to five years in prison 
and fines of up to $5,000 for violating this ban. And this Q&A section actually carries us right into our Florida edition of what's on that ballot. I've heard that there's an amendment that will be on the ballot this November that may affect abortion access in Florida. Can you tell me about that amendment? Yes! This November 2024, the amendment to limit government interference with abortion will be on your ballot in Florida. It is called Amendment 4, and voters will be able to vote yes or no on the amendment. So, Amendment 4 is a citizen-initiated ballot initiative regarding abortion access. It will limit government interference with abortion in Florida, and it will void the current abortion ban. If it passes, it will go into effect on Tuesday, January 7th, 2025. What does a yes vote for Amendment 4 mean? A yes vote means that abortion will be legal before viability or when necessary to protect a patient's health as determined by their health care provider. Yay! Oh! What does a no vote for Amendment 4 mean? A no vote means that Florida's abortion ban will remain in effect. Oh! Boo! But similarly to how there was more to talk about with abortion in Arizona, there is more to be said about this ballot in Florida. Because for as hard as Floridians worked to get it on the ballot, Republicans in the area are also working to attempt to throw it out. I saw something when I was Googling earlier from only a couple days ago about Ron DeSantis trying to undermine faith in the credibility of the signatures that were gathered to get the vote on the ballot. But as far as we know for now, it is still on the ballot. So please, if you're in Florida, vote yes on Amendment 4, and also vote out as many Republicans as you possibly can while you're at it. And now, for this next intermission, let's look into that. This is an article from TampaBay.com that I'm going to read from. Governor Ron DeSantis' administration released an unprecedented report on Friday accusing the organizers behind Florida's ballot amendment of committing widespread petition fraud in the drive to get the initiative in the ballot next month. The unusual 348-page preliminary report from the Florida Secretary of State advocates for the state legislature to change laws to crack down on future petition drives and it could lay the groundwork for an attempt by the administration to disqualify or invalidate the amendment, which DeSantis has vowed to defeat. The report alleges that organizers backing Amendment 4, which would overturn the state's six-week abortion ban, illegally paid circulators by the number of signatures collected. The report said that the state on Friday fined the organizers $328,000. The state audits estimate that 16.4% of petitions across the state should never have been validated, the report states. The report also includes sweeping generalizations about the petition drive without providing data to back them up. Amendment 4 was sponsored by Floridians Protecting Freedom and groups including the American Civil Liberties Union of Florida, which plans to contest the fine. The campaign director for Yes on 4, Lauren Brenzel, denied any wrongdoing. The campaign has been run above board and followed state law at every turn, Brenzel said in a statement. What we are seeing now is nothing more than dishonest distractions and desperate attempts to silence voters. The report, issued after Floridians started voting, is the latest example of the governor's use of state power to defeat Amendment 4, one of his top priorities this fall. Last month, the State Agency for Healthcare Administration launched a website advocating against the amendment, impossible violation of state law prohibiting state-sponsored electioneering. On October 3rd, the General Counsel for the State's Department of Health sent cease and desist letters to the Tampa and Gainesville television statements threatening to take criminal action if the statements refused to take down a political ad supporting Amendment 4. Since DeSantis and the legislature created the Office of Election Crimes and Security Office in 2022, it has never produced a report like the one released Friday and critics questioned the timing of its release. The report states that it was produced in advance of the upcoming legislative session to summarize its preliminary findings and reemphasize the need for more effective regulation of petition circulation. It is addressed to DeSantis, Senate President Kathleen Pasadoma, a Republican from Naples, and House Speaker Paul Renner, a Republican from Palm Coast. The legislative session doesn't begin until March, and it won't be known which members of the legislature will serve during that session until the November election. Renner won't be in the legislature last Renner won't be in the legislature next year because of term limits. State Rep Anna Escamani, Democrat from Orlando, 
said it's clear the intention of the report was not to inform state lawmakers. It's an attempt to mislead and confuse voters about three weeks ahead of an election, Eskamani said. They're sending the report to a lame duck speaker and Senate president. Critics have suspected that DeSantis' office has targeted the Amendment 4 petition drive for political reasons. A 2021 drive financed by Las Vegas Stands, whose late founder Sheldon Adelson was a mega donor to DeSantis and Republicans, had many more apparent signs of fraud, but that investigation fizzled with only the lowest level circulators being investigated, observers have noted. Why the state has focused on Amendment 4 over other amendment efforts is not clear. The report says that supervisors referred an unusually high volume of complaints to the state, but the report does not compare the volume of complaints to any other petition drive. This is so, so shady, and I fear that it's to set the groundwork to try to invalidate an amendment that actually passes. So voting in huge numbers is important here, and so is making sure that there are Democrats in as many positions of power as possible. And then next up, we've got Maryland. Maryland will be another shorter one because Maryland already has legal abortion access all the way up to fetal viability. And the vote isn't to expand, but to enshrine the access into your state constitution. So that's what's on that ballot. That's question number one for Maryland, the right to reproductive freedom amendment. Question one would amend the Declaration of Rights in the Maryland Constitution to add a new section that guarantees a right to reproductive freedom, defined to include the ability to make and effectuate decisions to prevent, continue, or end one's own pregnancy. The ballot measure is designed to prohibit the constitutional right from being denied or infringed unless there is a compelling state interest, which would need to be achieved using the least restrictive means. Currently, abortion is legal in Maryland until viability. Abortion is legal after viability if the woman's life or health is endangered or if there is a fetal anomaly. In 1991, the Maryland State Legislature passed Senate Bill 162, which said the state may not interfere with the decision of a woman to terminate a pregnancy before fetal viability. A yes vote supports adding a new article to the Maryland Constitution's Declaration of Rights establishing a right to reproductive freedom defined to include the ability to make and effectuate decisions to prevent, continue, or end one's own pregnancy. Bravo! A no vote opposes amending the state constitution to establish a right to reproductive freedom. So vote yes on one. Enshrining this stuff on a state-by-state -state basis is so, so important, and I'm glad that this is a state where there is already such clear access, because the next state that I want to talk about is very much the opposite. We're going back to discussing a state with an abortion ban, so we're going to talk about Missouri. But it is getting late and my arm is getting shaky from holding up the microphone and being sleepy, so I'm going to I'm going to sleep. We got a little bit less than halfway through on the first full day, and we have I have all day tomorrow. Uh I'm feeling good about it. I think, I think I'm going to do it. I mean, I'm definitely going to need all of Sunday, but maybe I'll finish before Monday. I was wondering if I was going to add another day to my weekend, but I don't know. We're halfway there. Hey, my aphasia in the last section was really bad. Normally, if I had what I'm saying on screen and I flub a word, I kind of just either re-record or I don't acknowledge it because I'm like, okay, people can read... TV statements? I meant stations. Sorry. My arm wasn't shaking because I was tired. It was because I was getting a migraine. It's raining today. I'm feeling better now, but I got a later start than I thought I would, which means also in the interest of finishing this video near the time frame I originally said I would, I don't want to do another intermission just yet because that Maryland one was so, so short and, you know, Nobody's actually really holding me to that. I make these rules for myself and then I stress about them and then I'm like, I'm making conversational commentary videos. Missouri is a state that has gotten a lot of attention in the national conversation around abortion bans. They were one of the immediate rash of states that enacted what was known as a trigger ban, as I mentioned earlier, when Roe fell and all of those states lost abortion at the same time. Missouri was one of them, and Missouri is one of the ones that lost it the hardest, even though we've already been going over how hard abortion access has been in these other states. Those other states have things like, you know, 
like that six week from the last menstrual period date that I think is overwhelming and insane. Missouri's ban is from the moment of conception. They ban all abortions except for to protect the life of the pregnant person. No exceptions for rape, incest, human trafficking, Missouri law continues to include requirements that pregnant people must undergo a mandatory 72-hour waiting period, receive biased counseling, and be offered an ultrasound, and prohibitions on public funding and private insurance. It continues to require that both parents, a legal guardian, or a judge consent to a minor's abortion. If a parent consents, that parent is required to notify the other parent. This is from reproductiverights.org, by the way. They have a webpage like this for every state. It is a fantastic resource. I'm linking in the description below specifically to the Missouri one, and also if I cite it for a future state, but highly recommend the work they're doing over there. Missouri retains targeted regulation of abortion providers, trap laws related to facilities, admitting privileges, and reporting. Missouri law continues to restrict the provision of abortion care to physicians and restricts providers from using telemedicine for the provision of abortion care. Providers who violate Missouri's abortion restrictions may face civil and criminal penalties. Missouri law does not include express constitutional or statutory protections for abortion. To the contrary, Missouri's policy preference is to ban abortion to the fullest extent of the law. Quote, it is the declaration of the General Assembly of the State of Missouri to, one, defend the right to life of all humans, born and unborn. Two, declare that the state and all of its political subdivisions are a sanctuary of life that protects pregnant women and their unborn children. And three, regulate abortion to the full extent permitted by the Constitution of the United States, decision of the United States Supreme Court, and federal statutes. Um, holy shit incredibly bleak, right? And the biased counseling thing, that's why I held off and I didn't talk about this just in Arizona because I knew that this happens in Missouri. If you haven't watched BoJack Horseman or if it's been a while and you're not familiar with the episode I was referencing earlier, there's an episode of a adult animated cartoon. I'm so sorry for describing something that way. But there's an episode of this show called BoJack Horseman, which is like a comedy satire about Hollywood and celebrity culture. I love BoJack Horseman. In one of the episodes, which I actually, as I'm working on this video, I'm thinking I would really love to make a video about this BoJack Horseman episode of abortion and that maybe it could be part of a series of videos where I talk about depictions of abortion in the media. Because I know Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, I also really like what they did with their abortion storyline as well. But there's this, I'm calling it a joke feels bad if you don't understand the tone of Bojack. Um, Diane Nguyen is one of my favorite characters in anything ever. Actually, uh, hang on. All my t-shirts are like too big for me to be like super comfortable filming in compared to when I'm wearing other clothes. Uh, it's just like a little too big on me for me to typically film in it, so it turned into a painting shirt, but I love this shirt so much. <laughs> There's an episode of BoJack Horseman where Diane has to get an abortion, and as BoJack satirizes everything, it satirizes that process. She and Mr. Peanut Butter go to a Planned Parenthood to access an abortion, and much like that list of requirements that I was talking about earlier, the doctor has to go through specific statements and things that Diane has to do before she can access this health care. I'm pretty sure I can show you a clip. And that sounds so fucking ridiculous, and yet it also isn't when you compare it to the whole, like, oh, you need to know exactly how big this fetus is, you need to know this and this and this and the possible eye color and all of this, and it's like, just let people get abortions. Just let them get abortions. And Missouri is obviously very inclined to do the fucking opposite of that. I looked to see if I could find another attorney general website for Missouri, and I think at this point it was just a weird fluke that those existed for the first two that I looked at, because I'm not having much luck with these states with abortion bans. Maybe that's as much, though, because they want to have it be complicated and hard to access. Interesting that it's not the state providing the information here, it's abortion access groups. But when I was looking around for a state website, I saw that the Secretary of State in Missouri attempted to throw out the abortion amendment completely. 
As we just saw in Florida, this is the kind of dirty play that Republicans love to try when they know that abortion is going to win on the ballot. And I do believe that this Missouri abortion question has a whole big chance of winning on the ballot because of the amount of signatures that it got in the first place. The Supreme Court ruled extremely narrowly to let this question remain on the ballot, but the question is on the ballot. So for my lovely Missouri friends, of which I know I have at least a few in the nuance corner with more certainty than any of the other states I've talked about before, I also know there's at least one in Maryland. I meant to say that at the time last night and then I forgot, but somebody commented on my recent posts about abortion saying that they recently voted in Maryland, which I thought was very cool. But I pinned a comment on the last video from a Nuance Corner friend in Missouri who was talking about Amendment 3, and somebody else responded to that and was saying how the Supreme Court tried to get the question thrown out. Again, I know everybody's telling you vote blue no matter who is cringe, but I mean, having blue team there probably is going to be really helpful if anybody's going to continue to try to fight this ballot after it probably overwhelmingly passes. So. For the Missouri edition of what's on that ballot, we have Amendment 3, the Right to Reproductive Freedom Initiative. The measure would amend the Missouri Constitution to provide the right for reproductive freedom, which is defined as the right to make and carry out decisions about all matters relating to reproductive health care, including but not limited to prenatal care, childbirth, postpartum care, birth control, abortion care, miscarriage care, and respectful birthing conditions. The amendment provides that the state legislator may enact laws that regulate abortion after fetal viability, which is defined in the initiative as in the good faith judgment of a treating healthcare professional and based on the particular facts of the case, there is a significant likelihood of the fetus's sustained survival outside the uterus without the application of extraordinary medical measures. However, any law enacted by the state legislature must not restrict an abortion which, in the judgment of a treating healthcare professional, is needed to provide the life or physical or mental health of the pregnant person. That mental health one is amazing. I would love to see that language in a lot of these. So for Missouri Amendment 3, a yes vote supports adding a fundamental right to reproductive freedom, defined to include abortion and all matters relating to reproductive health care to the Missouri Constitution, among other provisions. Bro! Yes. Yes on three, please. A no vote opposes adding a fundamental right to reproductive freedom to the Missouri Constitution. Boo. Again, just since I got less than halfway through last night, I'm going to roll some of these together before we hit another intermission, right? So the next state on our list is Montana, which currently protects the right to abortion up to viability. And let's jump right into what's on that ballot. The constitutional amendment would create an explicit constitutional right to an abortion. Currently, the right to abortion depends on case law surrounding the Constitution's right to privacy. The constitutional amendment would create an explicit constitutional right to abortion. Currently, the right to abortion in Montana depends on case law surrounding the Constitution's right to privacy provision. In Armstrong v. State, 1999, the Montana Supreme Court held that the state Constitution's right to privacy included a right to abortion until fetal viability. The ballot initiative would state that there is a right to make and carry out decisions about one's own pregnancy, including the right to abortion. The government would be permitted to regulate abortion after fetal viability, except to protect the life or health of the pregnant patient. This right could not be denied or burdened unless justified by a compelling government interest achieved by the least restrictive means. A compelling interest would mean a government interest to address a medically acknowledged health risk to the mother and does not infringe on the patient's own decision making. I don't really understand what that means. The amendment would prohibit the government from penalizing, prosecuting, or taking any adverse action against a person based on their pregnancy outcomes, nor against any person who aids or assists another person in obtaining an abortion. So a yes vote in Montana for Montana C1-128. A yes vote supports amending the Montana Constitution to provide a state constitutional right to make out and carry decisions about one's own pregnancy, including the right to abortion, and allow the state to regulate abortion after fetal viability, except when medically indicated to protect the life or health of the pregnant person. Bravo! 
a no vote opposes amending the Montana Constitution to provide a state constitutional right to make out and carry decisions about one's own pregnancy, including the right to abortion, and to allow the state to regulate abortion after fetal viability, except when medically indicated to protect the life or health of the pregnant patient. And the next state on the list that I'm working down is Nebraska, which has two different abortion bills, which means I need to do a little more research before I talk about it. Be back in a second. Okay, let's talk about Nebraska. Nebraska has two different ballot initiatives. So the current status of abortion in Nebraska is that it is banned after 12 weeks of pregnancy. The law banning abortion after 12 weeks, LB 574, was signed by Governor Jim Pillen, a Republican, on May 22, 2023. Exceptions include saving the life of the mother, preventing serious risk to the physical health of the mother, and if the pregnancy was a result of rape and or incest. And since there are two, I want to move immediately into what's on that ballot. And this is the only one that's actually curtailing abortion this year. And since this is the only one of its sort for what we're going over this year, let's start with the negative one first. This is a Nebraska Initiative 434, Prohibit Abortions After the First Trimester Amendment. A yes vote supports amending the state constitution to prohibit abortions after the first trimester unless necessitated by a medical emergency or if the pregnancy itself is a result of sexual assault or incest. A no vote opposes amending the state constitution to prohibit abortions after the first trimester unless necessitated by a medical emergency or if the pregnancy is a result of sexual assault or incest. Maybe weird to put the bravo soundbite right after I just said incest to last. But no is the vote that you would want to do on Nebraska Initiative 434 if you are looking to protect and expand abortion care in your area. This first one, the prohibit abortions after the first trimester amendment, no, no. And our actually good bill, though you do still want to vote against the bad bill. If you have an opportunity to vote no on an abortion ban, vote no on an abortion ban. Vote no on the first one, (laughs) and vote yes on Nebraska Initiative 439, the Right to Abortion Initiative. The measure would amend Article 1 of the Nebraska Constitution to add a new section providing a right to abortion until fetal viability, which is defined as, as, this is the same as we've already been saying, the point in pregnancy when you don't need extraordinary medical measures to keep the fetus alive after it's been born. Currently, abortion is illegal after 12 weeks post-fertilization. I'm very interested, though, that this is the only state with an anti-abortion bill on its ballot this year, which is especially interesting to think about when I'm looking at this right here on the ballot PDO website, actually, where it says, as of October 12th, 2024, 11 statewide ballot measures related to abortion were certified, and that it is the most on record for a single year. That's really interesting, and I think it could bode really well for Democrats in the election. This is what people are referring to when they say things like Rovember. And from what I've read, when abortion does go onto the ballot, even in places with these extreme abortion bans, it tends to go really well in terms of, well, in terms of what the abortion advocates would like. People tend to vote for abortion. Another state with both existing reproductive health care protections and the ability to vote on abortion this year is New York State. From what I was seeing, this is the only thing when we're looking at New York and we're asking what's on that ballot, other than obviously, you know, races and stuff, which is most of what an election is. So this is New York Proposal 1, Equal Protection of Law Amendment. The ballot measure would amend the Equal Protection Clause from the New York Constitution to prohibit a person's rights from being denied based on the person's ethnicity, national origin, age, and disability, as well as the person's sex, including sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, pregnancy, pregnancy outcomes, and reproductive health care and autonomy. As of 2024, the Equal Protection Clause prohibits the denial of rights to a person based on race, color, creed, or religion. So in New York, a yes vote supports adding language to the New York Bill of Rights to provide that people cannot be denied rights. That's what you want to vote on for several reasons. This is what you want to vote on. (laughs) This video is in specific about reproductive care, but also anywhere that you have anything to do with trans rights on your ballot, you should also vote in favor of that. 
A no vote opposes adding language to the New York Bill of Rights. We don't want that. We don't want that. I think this one is very, very likely to pass. As I've said before, I have high hopes for all of these, but this one in particular, I'm thinking pretty clear shot, right? Oh, and New York already has abortion up until fetal viability. I, I gave myself permission to go off outline and then I forgot to give you that piece of information. But yes, go New York. I hope this one passes as easily as I think it will. I also, another reason I should have looked at my outline more before I started recording, I, I was so excited about talking about those dueling abortion bills in Nebraska that I completely skipped over Nevada, even though I had been doing this alphabetically. Nevada currently has abortion legal until 24 weeks of pregnancy, and what's on that ballot is question six, the right to abortion initiative. This amendment would establish the right to an abortion in the Nevada Constitution until fetal viability or when to protect the life of the health of the pregnant patient. The amendment would first The amendment would establish that this right will not be denied, burdened, or infringed upon unless justified by a compelling state interest. And then this is the same language that we already had before when I was saying I don't really understand Unless justified by a compelling state interest, which is defined as an interest which is limited exclusively to the state's interest in protecting, maintaining, or improving the health of an individual who is seeking abortion care that is consistent with accepted clinical standards of practice. And then that same definition of fetal viability that we've already been using without the application of extraordinary medical measures. So on question six, a yes vote supports providing for a state constitutional right to abortion, providing for the state to regulate abortion after fetal viability, except where medically indicated to protect the life or health of the pregnant patient. Bravo! Yeah, that one. A no vote opposes providing for a state constitutional right to an abortion. <laughs> All right, we are down to one more state that gets to vote in November for abortion rights, and it's a state that is already banned. I would like to take one more intermission before we get there, because like I said, I want to talk about how well abortion has been doing when it made it onto the ballot. Okay, one last brief little intermission before our final state, because I was not exaggerating earlier when I said abortion does well on the ballot, and because I want something heartening before we talk about another state where such a fundamental human right is banned. Let's talk about how abortion has been doing on the ballot. I am pulling from an August article from NBC News. Abortion rights have won in every election since Roe v. Wade was overturned. California passed a state constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right to abortion in November of 2022. Kentucky rejected amending their state constitution to include language saying it does not protect the right to an abortion. Kansas rejected a state constitutional amendment that would have said there is no right to abortion. Michigan passed a state constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right to abortion. Montana, as we've already covered, gets to vote again, but in 2022, they voted to reject a measure that would have required medical workers who would have faced the prospect of criminal charges to provide care in the rare instances of babies born alive after an attempted abortion. Ohio rejected a measure that would have made it harder to pass an abortion rights constitutional amendment. They did not manage to get their amendment on the ballot this year, but they tried. And Vermont, too. Vermont passed a state constitution guaranteeing the right to abortion. These are places where people directly had abortion on the ballot and the opportunity to vote for it. There are more states where abortion is enshrined and protected in law, but it didn't go to a vote. Looking at the Center for Reproductive Rights map for abortion laws by state and just looking at who has expanded access since the Supreme Court overturned Roe, Washington. Abortion will remain legal in Washington. State law protects personal reproductive decisions, and Washington has enacted policies to expand abortion access. Oregon. Abortion will remain legal in Oregon. State law protects abortion, and Oregon has enacted additional laws to expand abortion access. California. Abortion will remain legal in California. The state's highest court recognized abortion rights under the California Constitution in 1969, four years before Roe. State law protects the right to personal reproductive decisions. In November 2022, Californians approved Prop 1, which explicitly adds abortion and contraception to the state constitution. 
Minnesota because Minnesota has been kicking ass, I guess, lately. I had no idea until very recently how awesome Minnesota seems to be. Abortion will remain legal in Minnesota. The state's highest court has recognized the right to abortion under the Minnesota Constitution, and in 2023, the state created a statutory right to reproductive freedom. In 2019, before Roe fell, New York enacted comprehensive abortion rights legislation, expanding access to abortion care in the state, and in 2022 enacted additional protections for abortion providers and helpers. In 2024, as we've gotten to, voters will decide whether to amend the New York Constitution to prohibit discrimination based on pregnancy outcomes and reproductive health care and autonomy. In Connecticut, state law protects abortion, and Connecticut has enacted additional laws to expand abortion access. Jersey, too. New Jersey in 2022 enacted a statutory protection for abortion as a fundamental right, and the state's highest court recognized the fundamental right of a woman to control her body and destiny under the New Jersey Constitution. And Maryland, we get to decide next month whether or not they're going to amend the Maryland Constitution to create a right to reproductive freedom, but it is and will remain legal in Maryland. Other states moved to protect it before Roe fell. Those are highlighted in yellow on this map. I'm not going to go over all of them, but if we're interested in doing a United States of Abortion video, I absolutely am willing to do that for every state in this godforsaken country and not just the ones that get to vote. Let me know if that's something you're interested in. But uh, let's talk about South Dakota. Okay, it is late on Sunday and disaster has struck. <laughs> I was already complaining on my Patreon recently about how the wire for my nice fancy microphone has not been staying plugged in and uh, it's like busted. <laughs> I don't even know how that happened. I don't think I stepped on it or anything, uh, but it is certainly not plugging into my microphone and I'm trying to finish this video when I said I would because I actually did it. I did all my research in time. I know about the South Dakota bill and I would love to talk about it. We'll see how this portion sounds with the audio because I haven't used these lav mics since I got my new microphone and I don't know where the clips for them went, so I'm holding it. I'm trying to keep it still. We'll see how it's going. <laughs> if this sounds okay, I'll use this section for the South Dakota thing, but if it's too bad, I'll just refilm it once I get a new wire because my bestie is getting me a wire sent for tomorrow. But again, I did learn about all 10 states in the weekend that I set out to learn about all 10 states, so I feel pretty good about that. So our final state in our list is South Dakota. South Dakota also suffers from a trigger ban, and honestly, even though I think a vote for abortion is still a good thing, and I think you should vote yes for this because it's better than the current access, I don't really like this next bill. I'll read you what it says from the Ballotpedia website about abortion access in South Dakota first. From what I'm seeing, I think that this state had one of the earliest trigger bans. It says, In South Dakota, abortion is banned except to save the life of the mother. In 2005, South Dakota passed the law banning abortion except to save the life of the mother. However, the law did not go into effect until the United States Supreme Court issued Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, which overturned Roe v. Wade. In 2023, South Dakota enacted a law that provided that the woman who receives an unlawful abortion is not criminally liable. South Dakota mandates a 72-hour waiting period and counseling before an abortion is performed. The state also requires that a parent or legal guardian of a minor must be notified 48 hours before a minor's abortion, or that a judge must approve a petition for the minor to have an abortion without parental notification. South Dakota also prohibits public funding for abortion. And I'm sorry I already spoiled that I'm not very enthusiastic about this one, but for the final time today, let's play What's on That Ballot. It is Constitutional Amendment G. It would provide a state constitutional right to abortion and provide that the state cannot regulate abortion before the end of the first trimester. During the second trimester of pregnancy, the state may regulate abortion, but, quote, only in ways that are reasonably related to the physical health of the pregnant woman, end quote. And during the third trimester of pregnancy, the state may regulate or prohibit abortion except, quote, when abortion is necessary in the medical judgment of the woman's physician to preserve the life and health of the pregnant woman. Put differently, a yes vote supports providing for a state constitutional right to abortion in South Dakota using a trimester framework for regulation. During the first trimester, the state is prohibited from regulating a woman's decision to have an abortion. Second trimester, like we just said, they can regulate, but only in ways that are reasonably related to the physical health of the pregnant woman. 
and during the third trimester, they can regulate or prohibit abortion except when it's medically necessary. I wish that it just said until viability like most of these bills do. I think until viability is a lot safer. I don't like getting cute with it and using trimesters. I don't think that's necessary. I think abortion access really should be a yes or no question. Can somebody who needs an abortion get one if they need it? And the answer should always be yes. A no in this one opposes providing for a state constitutional right to abortion, obviously, and maintains the ban that is currently in place. So not that one. A Nuance Corner friend actually commented from South Dakota and said, yes, we have an abortion ballot. Do your own research. Don't make judgments based on law signs. And I googled and I was like, law signs opposing (laughs) Amendment G because I was like, okay, I know that this person commenting on my video, though apparently there are some people who watch my videos who don't like abortion, which hopefully not after this one. But I figured because it was a commenter, I was like, oh, I think this is somebody who's pro-abortion. And I looked and the signs against this one in South Dakota that I immediately read and was like, this does not go far enough. They're saying like, this goes too far. This is like completely unregulated. And it's like, bro, they are giving you so many more concessions than I think you should get as conservatives who are anti-choice. Just like Jesus. But uh, those are the 10 states for right now. So I did what I set out to do between Friday and the end of Sunday. I do have some closing thoughts, but I want to wait until I can use my regular microphone again for that, just in case this portion does not sound good. But I think I'm still reasonably allowed to call this video. I spent the weekend learning as much about abortion access on the ballot as I could, or whatever I ended up calling it. So, uh, (laughs) Thank you for spending the weekend with me. I'll see you in the morning when I get my new microphone cord. Okay, it is Monday. I am editing my video and I wanted to give some closing thoughts now that I have a nice new microphone cord. (laughs) This is not going to be anywhere near the last time I speak about abortion on my channel, obviously, and I'm already planning on following up after results are in so we can see how each of these ballot measures did. So obligatory, maybe subscribe for that in the future if you're interested. I've mentioned already in this video that I live in Massachusetts, which has enshrined our right to abortion already. We actually did that together with gender affirmative care in our shield law, so people who came here either for reproductive care or for gender related care, or even just because they maybe have a trans kid who was being terrorized in another state, are protected. And I gave you a list earlier of some of the states in the United States that have protected access to abortion and which people from the states we've been talking about where it's banned travel to to access that abortion. Even outside of traveling to somewhere where abortion is legal, though, one point that I want to make absolutely clear, because while this video has been focused on the legality of abortion, because that's what gets voted on, abortion will always exist even if it is not legal. Abortion care has always and will always exist. The feminist iconography of the coat hanger and never again did not just spring up out of nowhere, and it's not about clothing. Even if you vote against an abortion ban because you think you're saving fetuses, because it makes you really sad to think about a potential baby, you are not actually voting that nobody will get an abortion because you don't get to vote on that. You get to vote on the legality of abortion, the safety of abortion, but people who do not want to be pregnant will find a way to not be pregnant. And those ways, when abortion is not accessible and legal, are much less safe than an appointment with a licensed doctor would be. Abortions will still happen, people will die, and it will be real people who already exist and not just the fetus inside of them. I do think something that is not acknowledged enough, that even screaming from the rooftops is not acknowledging enough, is how absolutely fine with the blood on their hands everyone who is pushing these abortion bans actually are. How many people die due to complications from either their pregnancy or from the birth that they are forced into. I don't like the word pro-life and I try really hard not to use it because these people are not pro-life, they are pro-forced birth. I've been very pro late-term abortion in this video because I think that is a useful stance to take in public because usually people just say late-term abortion doesn't happen, that's not real, nobody's worried about that. I'm willing to say, okay, yeah, I also think that's fine. But in no way should it be understood that I'm implying that late-term abortions are fun. I don't think chemotherapy sounds fun either. I don't think anyone's ever really hoping they can get chemotherapy until they need it, and then they're really hoping that they are able to access chemotherapy. 
I think the same is true for a late-term abortion. While I see a distinct difference between child loss and abortion, that line is not hard. I'll always have empathy for people who are mourning the decisions that they had to make regarding an abortion, but I think implying that what somebody is going through emotionally after a late-term abortion for a pregnancy they intended to carry child loss is the same as somebody who did not emotionally connect to that possibility is a way that people get us to agree that abortion in general, all of it, is sad and therefore should be banned. And I wanted to bring up that Massachusetts enshrined reproductive rights and trans rights together because I thought it's worth voicing that the struggle for reproductive rights and the struggle for trans rights are fundamentally entwined. It is about body autonomy, and the same people attacking one are consistently attacking the other. And also, trans men and non-binary people are absolutely capable of becoming pregnant and of needing an abortion. And even without that, which I think is like pretty well understood, despite the fact that a lot of the language that I used in things I was reading said women, Restrictions on IVF target the ability of gay, trans, and queer people to have children just as much as they do cisgender couples who are now also facing an inaccessibility of that care. But my real closing point here is, even if abortion isn't on the ballot for you this year, yes, it is. It is. Think of what we saw in Colorado, right? How that Democratic governor and attorney general were willing to say, even if this law does go onto the books, we will not enforce it. How having the right people in the right time to vote on the legislature in Arizona, however narrowly, meant that the criminalization from that civil war ban never went into effect. You might not directly have an abortion question on your ballot, but wherever you're voting, you should have options to put someone pro-choice in office, and you should make that choice every time you have the chance to make it. The one place where I really do not manage to find any fault with Kamala Harris's positioning in this campaign is her stance on abortion, and I am so, so grateful that it is Kamala we have running on abortion and not Biden, because while I believe Joe Biden thought that it should be legal and would have passed a law if he had a majority in the House and Senate and it crossed his desk, I don't think that Catholic old man is very concerned as the days tick by without abortion access, and I never heard as much passion in his voice about it as I've heard in Kamala's and even in Tim Walz's voice. I watched every single night of the DNC. I know it bothers some of you that I call myself a normie lib or a normie dem, which I think is hilarious. Clearly, I am further left of liberal. Normie lib is a joke, but I also don't really find liberal to be an insult the way a lot of internet leftists do, even though I have many friends who are some flavor of anarchist or socialist or communist, and I love them dearly. I agree with them on most every policy proposal. I just think the best way to get protections for this sort of thing is within the system that already exists, rather than burning the entire thing down in case what's next might not be better. Like, you do not know that your ideology will rise from the ashes of whatever comes after our current system. I do not know what ideology would rise from the ashes. That's why I identify myself with the way I have always and will always vote. Not because the Democratic Party will ever scatter plot quite as far left as I am. You're welcome to think of me as a leftist, but like... I was joking around about this on Twitter last night. This isn't a channel where I'm going to look you in the eyes and tell you that I'm the exact same kind of communist you are, and I do think it's a little silly to be super disappointed if you know that I'm still voting in your best interests and believe the things you believe. But anyway, normie damn moment, I watched every night of the DNC, and the focus on abortion rights and reproductive care was incredibly heartening to me. And so is the fact that I do genuinely believe that Kamala Harris would sign an abortion bill that reinstated access to all 50 states. And just as strongly, I do not believe that Trump would veto an abortion ban. I don't think anyone really believes that he would, but if you're somehow buying what he's saying about sending it back to the states, Look at what happened in the states that it's getting sent back to. Look what the Republicans there are doing. Look what happened in Arkansas. Look how many other states tried to get reproductive care off of the ballot. Even if abortion is not on your ballot, abortion is on your ballot. Women's rights are on your ballot. Trans rights are on your ballot. The person who will pick the next Supreme Court justices is on your ballot. Early voting has already started in many states. Go vote, maybe go vote early, but vote, and vote for the person who is going to protect abortion on a state level, and for the person who is going to protect abortion on the federal level if she has the chance to override these state-by-state -state bans. Abortion is a human right, and if you disagree, I have never once been speaking to you when I end my videos by saying I love you. I would like for you to unsubscribe from me.
people I am speaking to when I say I love you. Thank you so much to my Patreon subscribers. I'm going to film my Patreon video next, and then I'm going to come back to the main channel to talk about this minimum wage increase for servers here in my ballot in Massachusetts. If you're interested in a couple extra videos from me a month, you can find me on Patreon. Thank you so much to everybody who has supported me there or on coffee or any other way, including watching my long videos all the way through to the end. I love you. Exclusions apply. Have a nice week. If you're here in the United States, maybe let me know what you get to vote on below, whether or not you have a direct abortion question. Maybe tell me what's going on over there. I know Missouri gets to vote not in favor of ranked choice voting, but against making ranked choice voting illegal. Um, I wish y'all just got to vote for ranked choice voting, but make sure you vote against making it illegal. And also they're like, and make it so that only citizens can vote. And that is very much already what the rule is. <laughs> but I'll be back soon. Let me know if you like this video format. Uh, if you don't, maybe don't be super mean to me about it, but still. <laughs> Have a great week. Vote in favor of abortion. Please vote for Kamala Harris. You don't have to like anything else she's doing, but one of these candidates is going to protect abortion and one of them is not. And Jill Stein is not even worth mentioning because she's not a serious option. I have a whole video about that. You can watch that next if you'd like. But uh, that's as much as I learned about abortion over my <laughs> 48 to 60 or so hours of researching for this video. Thank you very, very much for coming along with me. Bye.